Warahmatullah. Wa alaykum as uh, guys, we're with um, the amazing Lena Muhammad today, who single-handedly <laughs> got me through my dissertation. <laughs> I forgot to add that. <laughs> Nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Lena's a, a fellow student at UCL. She graduated in the um, art history program and then went on to the prestigious Royal College of Art uh, to do a master's in art history before she went on to doing a human rights and law, which is what she's she's ex exploring other stuff now. But, but she's basically had a really um, strong affiliation with prominent institutions like Sotheby's and, um, from what I recall, the Tate, where she's um, been working on uh, uh, curating and things like that. So Lena has a really amazing insight into the art world which very few people that I've come across in general have so I call on her quite often to <laughs> give me um, some knowledge <laughs> and that's why I really wanted to talk to her about her dissertation which the, is the title of the talk the um, of today's video the oriental female body in the 19th in 19th century paintings and Lena you do you want to say hi because I've <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for that um, introduction. I don't, it, it's um, far too grandiose, but <laughs> it is. It is exactly like that. So basically, if we go straight into Lena's um, uh, thesis, I find it really interesting that she picked three um, prominent artists from the 1900s. And Lena and I have uh, done similar. Um, articles before where we've looked at contemporary artists as well as artists from the Orientalist period, which is typically the 18-1900s, would you say? Um, I, I suppose, I mean, Orientalist artists have spanned um, sort of quite a, a large period of European uh, and North American um, Western history. Um, but yeah, I suppose that period in particular can be defined as such. Okay, and particularly we're looking at French and um, some um, strong with the French because they had such a presence in Algeria and in Egypt and and then further into the Ottoman Empire. So we're looking at the way these artists would go travel and then do document. And what I found really interesting as soon as I started reading your thesis was how the this whole um, battle for you know what they say and what it actually is is so opposite. It's a complete inversion almost. So you have these um, male artists focusing on the harem, uh, the harem, which is basically a bathhouse, but you have a very strong um, European understanding of what that is, which is usually very sexualized, very um, demeaning to women, and then you have the uh, the Islamic or Muslim understandings of what that is. So I'm going to just go straight into um, asking you, Lena, what you feel about it rather than giving the whole thesis about what your what your thing is about. Um, I know you yourself has tra have traveled a lot. You've, you've been to, um, uh, remind me, you've, you've been to Sri Lanka, you've lived in uh, Libya, was it? Is that right? That's right, yeah. Yeah, and you've lived in England. So you yourself um, focus on travelers in this particular thesis that you wrote. Is it because you see yourself as a traveler also in, in like, for example, the West, and you're also propagating your own interpretation? Or is what fascinated you about their traveler status? Um, I don't think I ever thought of it like that, and I wouldn't want to think of myself like this. <laughs> European <laughs> artist, that would, I would have failed at everything <laughs> I think if I would position myself as such. Um, I think I, I I was thinking particularly when I when I wrote about these artists about this idea of um, the grand tour where they would um, sort of these affluent um, Europeans would travel around um, what was then known as the Near East and the Far East um, and it being sort of a, a, a pastime, a, a leisure pastime um, but was in effect their sort of attempt to Kind of conquer those parts of the world, um, even even if only in in imagination. Um, I'm not. I don't think I actively thought about 
my own history of traveling, which I did a lot when I was younger. And my family moved around a lot. Um, I don't also, and um, as in where you are right now, the this society is almost other, in at least in superficiality to you. So you, them being the other, and you being the the actual voice and center of your own narrative. Do you see yourself making a similar sort of um, uh, editing as you as you experience day to day life? So you mean you mean my position as a, as a Muslim woman? Yeah, and somebody not eth ethnically from the same background as the people that you're living with right now. Um, so I don't, I mean, I don't think, again, I'm not certain that that necessarily informed my deci decision to write about um these artists, although I obviously, I mean, the, so for example, the the women I write about in, I wrote about in my dissertation, um, they were Muslim women, and so I suppose I, I I felt some need to to write about them in them in that act of misrepresentation. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not I'm not kind of I'm not so certain about how that figures in terms of how I see myself in the context of British society. I think, I mean, there's obviously a process of othering that happens, and um, particularly um, for Muslim women who um, wear the hijab um, and sort of, and so are then visibly Muslim. Um, so there's, there's a process of othering, but it's, it's kind of obviously in different contexts and in, in different periods, it's, it's different. I wouldn't want to make sort of um, general statements or general sort of. Um, yeah, I'm very wary of that usually. <laughs> okay, and with regards to, I felt like you you mentioned you know you you wrote about the Muslim women and you felt you had to get their perspective in there. Did you feel you were defending the position of the other when you were writing this? Um, I didn't feel like I needed to defend them. I wanted to. So okay, I I think. I wrote this a very very long time ago, yeah. and um, there are some some real problems with what I wrote. Um, I don't think I ever wanted to defend them because I don't. It, and it wasn't. The thing is, what I realized when I was writing about them was that these women kind of they didn't feature at all. It was imagined women that featured in these narratives. So there was no one to really defend and it wasn't really my place to defend anyway I'm not an Arab woman so I you know I can't speak for anyone it was more my interest was more in the way in which um, white men in particular and also white women constructed their own identities and their own um, positions of superiority by virtue of their whiteness and the way they were able to construct that in opposition to um, brown women. Um, that was more my interest, that power dynamic and um, the way in which um, colonialism as a racist white supremacist project um, was kind of uh, uh, kind of unfolded through those visual depictions. I'm not certain at that time when I was writing it I could quite articulate it in that way. I, I, so I, I in, in preparation for talking to you uh, I reread my dissertation which I hadn't done in so many years and white supremacy, the, the phrase white supremacy never came up which I think is interesting but it would certainly I think in the way I was trying to articulate it it's certainly you know that I, that concept is certainly there. And what are the underlying politics at the time of your own personal um, experience you know this was at the end of your uh, own five-year journey in academia you're in a UCL is like a, um, a Jewish mostly we call it UCL <laughs> white upper class in those not not if you study medicine there you only find mostly Muslims or brown people but if you study the arts you come across a very definite social um, demographic and you know how, how is it that you kind of use this to position yourself um, okay, so it was at the end of, of a three-year degree. So I, unlike um, you, I had a, a more length degree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, so I don't, I, I don't recall. I mean, in my department, it was all white. Um, sort of very, on on the whole kind of at least the way I perceived it, very sort of upper class. Um, 
and I recall there being one person in, in, in one of my classes who was doing this presentation on an Italian Renaissance artist and was talking about how his grandfather owned one of their pieces. Yeah, and it was that happened his, <laughs> and it was hanging above his mantelpiece, um, and I and it it was just a really bizarre um, experience for me because I mean I I I myself come from, you know, quite a, a privileged background, but there was something about being in that art history department that was so alien to me. Um, there was um, such an elitism and affluence that I just I couldn't quite get my head around um, and so I wrote I mean when I started my um, degree I was kind of really interested much to my shame very much interested in Italian Renaissance art and um, kind of really wanted to specialize in that and That's then I'm beautiful I guess it's just the standards of beauty that I've, I definitely love the Renaissance um, artists to this day it's my favorite it, I can't deny yeah, it <laughs> I, mean, I, can, I have an appreciation for it in I guess from an aesthetic point of view but I'm also very conscious of the fact that my appreciation for it is very much framed by a Western articulation of beauty mm. and so that I, I've been I've been coerced. I feel like I've been coerced into having an appreciation for that, mm -hmm. and I don't like that. So I, you know, I, I don't, I don't go to art galleries anymore. I don't do any of those things because um, I feel like I can't. I have an appre any appreciation I have of these spaces and the objects that hang hang within them is false, and it's been constructed by an external force that I'm not comfortable with. Um, but just g going back to, you know, why I started writing about this, it was because, um, really shockingly, um, or, well, actually not that shockingly for UCL, um, I, we, we did not look at issues of race, we did not look at issues of empire in the way that we should have. Empire was touched upon but in, in the way that we should have. Um, it, was, it wasn't addressed and um, actually there's, there's a sort of a campaign going on at UCL at the moment um, called Why Is My Curriculum White? I don't know if you've come across this yet Aru, but um, it's really excellent and it's an, it's an attempt to critique the ways in which every single um, syllabus within UCL is um, is built upon whiteness and it privileges whiteness so um, you know the the academics that are studied the theories are studied that are studied are all centered around um, a, a kind of Euro eurocentric and and position whiteness as the ideal and um, white intellectual thought as the ideal um, and negates the contributions of any other people from other parts of the world and so the art history department was you know was performed that um, in the most remarkable way and so um, it was at the end of my second year, I think, that we finally came across Edward Said in his book Orientalism that was kind of just dealt with in one week from what I can recall. Um, but that just, it, it changed a lot for me. Um, and kind of, um, so I did my own research and then realized by the time of my final year that I, could, I had to abandon um, the Renaissance mm. and start writing about this. But, 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 Still, I mean, I realized there was something that I needed to write about, but it was still, you know, I having reread my dissertation, I'm still I'm referencing um, white philosophers, and I'm, re you know, it's it's still very Eurocentric, and you know, I, I I mean, I guess I have to give myself a break. I was still quite young, but um, I was I was still trapped within that. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, that's my next point. I don't know if you've come across Miriam Fran uh, Francois Sara in um, in her so very briefly. She touches sometimes upon Orientalism, even though mostly she deals with like foreign policy and things like that. Politics. Uh, she mentions that we um, Muslims cut a fall into danger. I don't know if you agree of uh, being pigeonholed into topics which are being discussed for us. So we're always being discussed about 
and we come into discussions that were being discussed about, but we're not the ones generating the discussion. Even if you look at Orientalism, like who are the renowned classical figureheads of Orientalism? There's Fanon, there's um, Edward Said you just mentioned, and there's, um, well, Fanon is kind of, you know, he's more like um, French, um, black identity almost. And there's um, uh, Homi Baba, who's um, more recent in Harvard. I, you probably know way more than than my limited knowledge, but that's um, from what I can, at the top of my head. And none of them are Muslim, basically. They speak, still speak from a perspective outside of Islam. So do you think that, um, you know, we're, we're still in this danger of being reactionary rather than generating our own um, discussion? We're still speaking from the sidelines, as it were. Um, okay, so there are a few things that... Um, um, to respond to. I don't think, um, yes, I think that um, black and brown people, are, um, and within that I'm including Muslims obviously, on, um, are constantly having to respond to a narrative that's being presented. Um, so yes, the, the world is constructed according um, to a white supremacist view of the world that privileges white people and and thereby um, underprivileges non-white people. Um, so yes, it means that we're constantly having to respond to that. So you want to, and I, um, I'm going. I'm sorry. I'm going to go off on a tangent, mm. uh, but I, I th th Islam, I think, um, has the capacity to allow us, um, a sociologist called Salman Saeed talks very eloquently about this, uh, writes very eloquently about this, and he talks about um, how Islam is a language that Muslims can um, use to articulate, um, so uh, articulate their, their histories, but also to be able to articulate stories about themselves now. So it, it provides a process of resistance to this narrative that's created, a, a Eurocentric narrative that's created, um, that, um, like you said, we're constantly having to respond to. So that's one point. I think, though, that I wouldn't want to... I think Fanon is hugely important for Muslims. In well, yeah, it's, people do say he, he reverted when he, when he went over to Algeria. I'm not even certain that that's... I, I'm not... <laughs> I mean, I'm not particularly interested in that, to be honest. I don't feel that that's, even if he's non-Muslim, I think his work is hugely important for us to understand. Um, the well, I'm not arguing the importance of the work, just to cut you in, but just the fact that there's a com you'd appreciate there's a totally different perspective from someone that speaks within Islam and someone that speaks outside, because then they're simultaneously having the possibility that Islam itself has, is, could be a part of the oppressive structure. Whereas a Muslim speaking from within Islam would not hold the same opinion. I no, I think um, I guess you're right, but I think also we have to distinguish between um, what Islam is and the way Islam is being used. So I don't think we can necessarily say that, for example, histo like historically, Islam has um, uh, been expansionist, and it ha and people have used. Um, Islam to sort of um, achieve certain ends, and so I think I don't think that compromises your faith or your kind of belief in in the Word of God or anything like that to acknowledge that there are um, problematics within the history of Islam. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's an, an an aside, really. I think Fanon's work is still hugely important, whether or not he, um, you know, whether or not he's Muslim. I think um, uh, you mentioned Homi Baba and. Edward Said, I think they're both, um, they are both important. Said, I feel more so, but I think we still have to acknowledge the fact that all these figures are kind of very privileged, mm. you know. Um, Homi Baba um, and Edward Said, they speak of the, um, the, the sort of, the way in which the West constructs itself and the racism um, inherent in it, um, but they also come from very privileged positions and from within the West as well, right? Yeah. Um, 
so and and that's also that there's a power dynamic there that's sort of um, quite problematic. So that brings me on to asking you: uh, Do you think that it would benefit Muslims to study the, these paintings and these ideas that have been propagated about them? It's kind of like studying CNN, but a few hundred years ago. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's an interesting comparison. Yeah. Um, hmm. I mean, I'm always, I'm, I'm often in two minds about this. I mean, I think it's important to understand the way in which, because there's a, there's a violence in the way in, in this representation. There's a violent, and I, I think I, I did touch upon this in my dissertation, the way in which women in particular um, are um, Muslim female bodies are, are represented um, there is a violence to it because it, it, it presumes um, that the person doing the representing owns that body mm -hmm. has the right to represent it and so that is a violence and then by, by sort of um, seeing the body in that way exposed in a way that um, they don't necessarily have permission. There is a violence in that as well. So I think it's important to understand the ways in which um, uh, Europe and the West, in its process of coloniality, has committed multiple acts of violence in physical form, but also in um, epistemic form, um, uh, to to us, to our ancestors, to our history, um, but at the same time, they're such vile pictures. I just want like they should all burn, you know. Well, I was going to ask you: Do you think they should be erased from history, or should we buy them and put them on our mantelpieces? <laughs> so this is another this is another debate, and it's really interesting actually. Um, a lot of these Orientalist works from the 19th century are being bought um, by. Um, very wealthy patrons in the Gulf region. Mm. Um, so they go, there are massive auctions at Sotheby's and Christie's and they tend to go, they, you know, they're bought for just the most ridiculous amount of money and they're put on display. Um, I think sometimes they're in, in private, in sort of in private collections and sometimes they're put on display in, um, in sort of the larger art galleries and museums in like um, Qatar and UAE and um, so, I mean, like, their argument is that, well, this is a history that was taken from us in the construction of this idea of the Orient, um, and so we are taking it back, and mm -hmm. it's going to be on our terms, which I think is an interesting argument. Um, it's interesting but, that you say that, just to uh, add to that point, because... Um, I mean, the other kind of history that has been physically erased from public consumption, anyway. The, well, I was working for a year with a, um, a, a, a Adam Williamson, who's who restores classical Islamic art, and he's been employed by very rich, wealthy private owners of huge collections of Islamic art that are not Muslim. And there's all kinds of things in their vaults and in their uh, in their private um, storage units where there's Qurans that have words that literally kiss when you close the page, so they're mirrored the way the Qur'an is written. And these are uh, miracles of craftsmanship, you'd be able to say, but there are elements of our history which no Muslim will ever hear about or see because they're in the hands of very wealthy bankers. And, you know, why... Well, that's a whole area of our history that, so for some reason, is completely not in our control or, or being brought to attention. I mean, I want to know what the Louvre in Abu Dhabi is being filled by. <laughs> why is it being focused? Why is it focusing on this, these paintings rather than that stuff, which some would argue is more important. I'm very conscious of time. I have one minute of the 20 minutes that I asked you, but I have one more question for you. It's up to you if you if you have the time to afford that or not. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. Go ahead. But although I did, um, I did want to, can I just add to the um, previous point? Because, so I, I think that's an interesting argument. I don't quite buy it. You know, the fact that um, these um, Qataris, for example, are buying this work as a way of reclaiming this history. Um, because I, they would I, buy I, that stuff then, right? There's other stuff that they would be purchasing too. Well, exactly. And it, and it feeds into um, the sort of um, the the market forces that drive like Western art, the Western art world, which defines an, a set of aesthetics that the whole world has to abide by. So mm -hmm. I'm just I don't buy it. I think it's I think it's um, 
it, it, it's not a convincing argument to me. Sorry? I never thought of it like that, actually, because they are, uh, uh, Damien Hurst had one of his most expensive exhibitions in Qatar, so oh, right. it doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah. I know, I, yeah, it's, it's the whole, there's so much, there's, it, there's so much so ridiculous about it, but also, I mean, so the alternative, and this is what I've been thinking more and more about, is that these, so, like I was saying, it's, Colonial, colonialism is not just about physical violence and the and and the conquest of land and all of that. It's about an epistemic violence as well. And so, to me, the creation of these works there there is an epi there is a serious epistemic violence in it because um, it has constructed this aesthetic of the Orient that is a, is a complete fallacy. So. As even despite the fact that I have an art background, I went to art school. I I like to make art myself. I would not have an issue with these works being destroyed. But I think it's something I go back and forth on, and maybe it's but it's a bit too um, extreme a reaction. But I think that I think it's something that needs to be considered. Yeah. Well, I, I definitely agree with you because, I, I mean, just like you were saying, the sheer nature of the violence is so violent and it's so violating because if you, even if you look at like Le Corbusier or Picasso, these are these are canonic figures of modernist uh, art and, you know, they, uh, Le Corbusier, for example, painted an, a scene of, of veiled women with, absolute, with all their clothes ripped off and that is, uh, that is something that is actually um, physically... Um, uh, it's canonizing and uh, immortalizing, and then put to put a frame around it and put it in a gallery is embellishing a, a sheer act of, of of extreme violation. And w I mean, it's I think it's interesting. Maybe just because we're not aware that they've gone that far, that um, we haven't asked for an apology for these things, and we haven't uh, we ask for reappropriation for wealth, for example in some of the lands that were taken and the manpower that was taken from us, but we don't ask uh, for a re a, a, an apology or a, um, a giving back, or at least an acknowledgement that this was wrong, mm -hmm. you know? Do you, do you see them making any sort of apologetic gesture to, 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 to note how disrespectful it was? Um, no, because these works, are, um, as you've touched upon, are part of this canon of Western art history that is um, an elite form of cultural production, at, at least the way it's positioned in the West, that, that um, systematically excludes certain people from it. So um, if you are white and wealthy, you have access to those spaces that holds these artworks, and also you have access to the discourse that is created around them. Um, if you are, if you don't have access to those things, you are not seen as worthy of being able to contribute to that that discourse or anything around those artworks. Um, so you're locked out. You're locked out of it if you have any critique of it. So it's this hallowed. Um, it's this um, sort of um, hallowed space where, um, yeah, there's just no. It's perfect. It's on a pedestal is perfect in the way that it's constructed in the West. So there is no con there is no understanding or conception of what you would possibly need to apologize for. Well, it's just the accepted norm, isn't it? And that's where, uh, finally, just to say, I, I found it really interesting that some of the stereotypes that you mentioned, especially like uh, the, uh, the red hot, uh, the the almost like maddening nature of the Algerian Arabs or the fact that they're very, you know, red hot in their temper, they're barbaric, these kinds of, um, I'm not sure if I'm particularly talking about this essay, I can't recall, but I read, it, it's a blur now to me that I've been reading into this, and it's interesting how we Muslims also re reiterate these stereotypes sometimes, like, oh yeah, you know, Algerians are very hot-blooded and Egyptians have bad tempers, and it's interesting that our own uh, philosophers, like Ilham Iqbal, for example, you know, we see them as people that have produced our culture, but really they've been at a level of influence where they went to German universities, they also studied this sort of stuff which has been pedestalized and taught, like John Ruskin is saying that the hot sun directly on their head gave them hot tempers, that's why they're people that are, are a bit ditzy up there. You know, these are things that 
people from Cambridge and Oxford that are apparently scholars of the fields that we study, which is the humanitarian subjects, um, are, are taught and, and studied as, as if it was scripture. So, you know, it's unchallenged and it's ridiculous that you think about it now. But um, is it a wonder <laughs> that Muslims are, are mostly just sticking to science and facts rather than going into... But it's interesting how we, even if they don't study art, they still have these stereotypes. Like it's pe penetrated so deeply into... So you, we, we carry on the othering process for ourselves, would you say, on their behalf? <laughs> um, in that we don't challenge it, we don't know how to challenge it. Yeah, and also we don't know that these, these stereotypes have actually come from these... Yeah, I think, I, and I don't think, I don't think it's necessarily um, an issue that only Muslims face. I think all, all people of colour, um, all marginalized communities um, marginalized in you know in the way that the West marginalizes um, are subject to that where we are not aware of our own history or we're written out of this like the greater canon of history um, so we're all we're, we're contending we're contending with that so for in terms of like our education from when we're in primary school right up until we get into university we're indoctrinated with this idea that the West is the best and everything else is second class so we're not aware of our own history and so it's no wonder that we kind of perpetuate these ideas that oh well empire wasn't so bad and oh well all, all these great thinkers like you know going back to Descartes uh, you know, are the greatest, and this is how we need to construct our own uh, understanding of the world. Um, you know, it, it's no wonder that we think that because we're in, indoctrinated from the word "go," um, and we can't see that it's all nonsense, and that you know, it's just it priv it like I said before, it privileges whiteness, like a white white thought, white action, all of that. Um, but I think I think that. Um, it's a shame, you, you, you kind of mentioned it, that um, a lot of, um, I, I guess a lot of Muslims, from middle, I would, have, I would say from middle class background, in the, at least within the UK, tend to go into sort of, if they go to university, tend to study sciences. Um, and it's, it's also, perhaps it's to do with this, lack of understanding of the humanities because the humanities is just about whiteness mm -hmm. we can't like we can't engage with that well yeah, so yeah um but also it's a shame because these the sciences tend to feed into very specific professions and so we feed in so <laughs> we're, yeah we're like we're still you know we're propping well, up the state that is a neo-colonial like imperialist state so we're doing, like you kind of whatever path you choose if you go into these institutions these institutions are funded by the state they everything that you learn is in service of the state so whatever you study you're still you're still screwed you know <laughs> and on that note <laughs> <laughs> sorry <laughs> no not at all it's actually really um, always so inspiring to hear from you Lean. I don't want to take any more of your time but you know the 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 extensive amount of books that I've been able to come in contact with you and the amount of knowledge I gain every time I speak to you. I'm really grateful for it every time. And uh, I just want to thank you again. And I really, really hope that you benefited as much as I did from this. <laughs> thank you so much for having me on your channel. I'm very excited to be here. Pleasure is mine. I'll just stop the broadcast and say something.